Hello, everybody. I am uh, Simon Ilyushenko from the Google Earth Engine team. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm a, a creator of the Google uh, Awesome GE Community Catalog, and I'm also a Google developer expert. Hi, everyone. My name is Bobby. I'm from an organization called NGIS. Yeah. We'll be talking today about the Earth Engine Data Catalog, or rather catalogs. And I will start with the first section, and then I will pass the baton to uh, Sam and Bobby. Sounds good. Uh, so I'm Simon Ilyushenko. I am the tech lead of the ingestion team. I've been on the project since it started in 2009, which was quite a trip. But today I'm here to talk just about what happened uh, in the last uh, year. The title of this talk is Attention Data Catalog. Oh no, the title is not correct. It's Data Catalogs. This is the first time we can have this title because one of the main things uh, we will talk about today is how we can have multiple data catalogs uh, in the Earth Engine interface. Other things we are going to talk about is what happened with the data team uh, during the last 12 months. This is the first part, and then I will pass uh, the mic to Sam and Bobby to talk in details about what they have done and what they plan to do with the catalogs. Um, as most of you probably know, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this, uh, we have a huge catalog uh, with over 1,000 data sets, roughly adding about 100 a year. We just passed 90 petabytes uh, a few months ago. Uh, it's a lot to manage. It's been interesting technologically, organizationally, in various ways, but uh, this is great. So we are happy to provide all this data for attention users. So the first thing I want to discuss is, uh, I'm sorry for obscure title, GitHub checks and user edits. Sounds exciting. I will tell you why it's exciting. You may have seen uh, pages like this, I assume, if you uh, use our uh, interface, HTML interface to the catalogs. This is just a typical page for SRTM. Uh, it has a bunch of fields, it has a thumbnail, it has description, so some, everything that, you know, not everything, many things you need, you need more, but this is what we provide right now. Uh, the way this is implemented uh, is we have uh, JSON files in a format called stack. Stack is not a Google format. Uh, it's a more or less industry standard recent format which stands for spatial temporal asset catalogs. And that's how we encode all these fields that show up on the catalog pages. Uh, some of the fields uh, in red are standard. Some of the fields like size citation are extensions. Uh, we are allowed to make up our own extensions which we use because we need a lot of fields. Uh, this is the bread and butter of the data catalogs. And uh, we have first started working with Stack two years ago, and we started by just putting our uh, descriptions in this format, which already gave us something nice, like ability to use external um, browsers like Stack Browser. So external uh, people are doing the work that is useful uh, to us and to attention users. Uh, next, we move to JSON-NET files. They are more complicated because this is Google and we like things to be complicated. Um, sorry, I skipped a step. This is Google. We have a lot of things. A lot of things require complications in the backend. JSON-NET is a programming language, strangely enough, for producing uh, JSON files. It has imports, conditionals, loops. Uh, it's important for us because it lets us um, write data set descriptions uh, in a convenient way so we can encode some fields once and then uh, not worry about them getting out of sync. So this is the equivalent uh, several fields for SRTM. Uh, for example, this is a live screenshot from a live dataset description. Uh, we have a number of Jedi datasets. The text at the bottom is common for all of them. The text at the top is common for L2A. And as you can imagine, we don't want to have multiple copies of this, uh, this text floating around. So what we do is we encode them in common strings, import them, and combine description together. So this was uh, the summary of what we were doing last year. Last year, we put our JSONnet files on GitHub. So you can see them now in all their glory. They're all public. 
Finally, what is new? Uh, as of uh, this summer, summer of 2023, we started accepting user edits from GitHub. So now the uh, data can flow both ways. And several people have already uh, submitted uh, uh, changes, corrected typos. So thank you, uh, everybody. The other thing we did is also moved our JavaScript examples to the same GitHub repo. Uh, again, because it's more transparent and we are able to accept user input. And finally, which was a very big effort, so thank you, Gert. Uh, we have uh, ported an existing checks and added more checks. So now there are about 500 various validity, uh, semantic and syntactic checks uh, on these data sets. And uh, if you are submitting external edit, you might sometimes see this error message uh, on the right, which is good, which means you know, we are detecting something and humans don't have to worry about uh, dealing with these errors. So this is all relatively boring infrastructure. However, all of that set up stage for publisher and community data catalogs, which you'll hear a lot more later. I will just you know, uh, introduce them very briefly and then uh, uh, Sam and Bobby will discuss it in more details. Um, as of this morning, uh, if you go to our HTML interface, you will see the two new fields at the top navigation bar, publisher and community. Uh, you will also see a new gray text on some of the data sets, which tell us that they are not managed by us. Oh my God, we are giving up some control. This is a good thing because we don't want to control everything. It just requires too much effort and we would like uh, our community, our external users to help us with creating more data set descriptions and uploading assets. So what, this will, uh, uh, what does it mean for you? You will see some of the uh, assets um, and data sets in the same interface with some changes and showing where they came from. They will have all the same fields, hence all those checks we have created before. Uh, you will see who our uh, partners uh, are. And I shouldn't say partners, in this case, we separate between publishers. Publishers means people uh, who own the data. They upload uh, their own data. They manage their assets and their descriptions. So Geoscience Australia is the first organization, so thank you, uh, who were uh, helped by NJS to put some of their data sets. Uh, and Planet is here because we looked at the Planet NICFI data sets and they turned out to be, uh, match this model already very well, and they graciously permitted us to also include uh, the data sets in this program. This is just NICFI. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, NGIS helped Geoscience Australia. This is just a preview. This is the first model we know um, how to work with. There will probably be more once we go in the future to general availability. We don't quite know how this will work, so if you do, actually, please come and talk to us and you know, suggest us modes of uh, working with publishers. And of course, community data catalogs. Uh, you must know about Sam's catalog. It's been great. It actually has more data sets than uh, the Earth Engine catalog. I think it's 1,300 now. Uh, we're not, we don't have all of them, unfortunately. I wish you know, we could have launched. We are launching just uh, to start in, uh, with a few. Uh, but it's already uh, very respectable 320 terabytes with a lot of uh, use. Uh, they are uh, you know, requested by uh, many people. And so it was a very natural choice to offer uh, uh, Sam the chance to use community catalogs. Uh, so you will hear more about this later. Now let's go back to uh, the things that our team, attention that the team has been working on. Very brief preview into ingestion delay stats. This is nowhere near ready. This is not going to be public anytime soon. I'm just showing you a very uh, quick snapshot of our ongoing work. Uh, as you can imagine, we care a lot about latency, and when we don't, people remind us, so we have to. And so we have been building a lot of uh, infrastructure for tracking our pipeline performance. Uh, so thank you, Dan. Uh, and this is just a snapshot from a few weeks ago uh, of several of uh, our pipelines for some of the important data sets. Uh, so this is the median percentile of, inge uh, of ingestion time from the uh, time of file creation to the time of Earth Engine asset creation. And uh, this is not a typo. Goals data are ingested very quickly within one minute because they are very small and they are created every few minutes. It's important to have them quickly. 
Um, the next data set, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, uh, create, uh, ingested within a few hours, because they are ingested by uh, near real-time jobs. Um, dynamic world is also based on Sentinel-2. It uh, takes slightly longer, because there are some more steps. Um, MODIS and Sentinel-5P are typical of other data sets which are not near real-time, so it takes about a day to ingest them. Um, the last row for Lancet is uh, confusing even to us, because uh, right now the stats are not perfect. We just think everything was created uh, on a midnight because uh, it's hard to find the date, so the uh, stats are artificially high. There is a lot of work here, but uh, eventually we are working towards making these dashboards uh, available at least internally to inform uh, first us and eventually users about how well our pipelines are, are doing. Uh, now, hopefully the fun part of the talk. We have 131 new data sets ingested over the last 12 months. Here they all are. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about all of them in excruciating detail. <laughs> now, uh, here are the highlights, which I think, uh, especially if you have the slides, I encourage you to browse. Um, HLS is the top requested data sets. It's almost ready. It's been in ingested right now. Unfortunately, we didn't quite make it on time. It should be uh, available pretty soon, at least the L3 part. Uh, even this list is a little bit too much to talk about, but let me just give you some fun highlights. And I will try to, uh, when I try to explore this, I ask myself, what's the way, best way to present this? So I assume um, algorithm theoretical basis isn't something I should be talking about in detail here. Uh, so I just tried to find something new and interesting in the data sets which I did not know about, and eventually you know, I learned a few more things about uh, what's happening on our planet. So let's start with uh, JAXA Scansar. These are not just the yearly mosaics which we had before. Uh, these are actually uh, individual uh, Pulsar 2 images uh, produced by JAXA. And here we have you know, this you know, huge uh, white spot clearly around rivers, clearly around some water. Does anybody know what this might be? Yeah, don't be afraid to you know, shout uh, if you know. This is, uh, I had no idea what this is, so don't be surprised. These are mangroves. This is one of the uh, probably biggest uh, national parks preserving mangroves uh, in the delta of Ganges River uh, in both India and Bangladesh. Uh, turns out mangroves are pretty bright on radar because, and forgive me if I uh, no, uh, say this wrong because I just had to look it up. There is a double bounce effect uh, from radar reflecting first from water and then from mangrove tree trunks, which are quite dense. Water normally is just you know, uh, pretty dark on radar and you know, normal vegetation is also not especially bright, but somehow the combination um, is bright. Oh, and I should explain why this is green. I overlaid uh, the radar image uh, on WGPA polygons, which we already had in Earth Engine, to show the boundaries uh, of the uh, protected areas, and you can see they uh, match pretty well. The next data set, as you may have heard, it's been popular somehow, especially in the last few weeks, I'm not sure why. Um, open buildings polygons released uh, by Google from our internal data. Unfortunately, it's still not the whole world. Uh, it does cover a lot. So the question I ask myself, um, let's look at some city, for example, Singapore, it's an interesting city. And let's find the biggest buildings by area, because area is one of the properties of these polygons. And I, using the minimax, I just you know, quickly plotted the buildings. I found uh, the reddest, red building is the widest one. Yellow buildings are also very big. Any guesses to what they are? Uh, hint, they're allocated on Expo Drive. And indeed, there are Expo Halls in Singapore. I don't think this is Expo Hall, I think this is the subway station, but at least that's where they're allocated and look sufficiently futuristic. Um, I saw that, I was kind of bored because uh, Expo buildings are very large and gray. Uh, ours is actually much better, but I think those were more boring, so I asked myself the other question. What are the smallest buildings in Singapore? And I just tuned, uh, didn't do any computations, just tuned visualization and found, for example, this yellow building. Any guesses to what this is? Close. Yeah. Uh, this is really hard to tell from satellite image. It's not security uh, guard booth. This is, I think, this is an elevator booth uh, on the parking lot. I'm not sure this counts as a building, though you know, we might you know, postpone this question until the philosophy conference, which Google eventually should have, I hope. 
Uh, but you know, the algorithm decided that this is a separate building. And there are a few uh, more outliers like this. Oh, by the way, this image is from Street View. So I just went and used Street View to find what this is. Um, a few more things, uh, we are happy to introduce uh, European um, author-rectified imagery, mostly aerial imagery from several countries. And no mystery is here, just a couple of uh, fun highlights. This is the famous water bridge in the Netherlands. This looks like this is a stitching problem. It's not, it's a real image because you have a water bridge on top uh, and uh, actual uh, normal roadway at the bottom. So there are sometimes photographs of ships passing across uh, the highway. Another image I liked uh, is these are uh, uh, rainfalls or rainfall uh, in Switzerland. I learned that this is the most powerful waterfall in Europe. And at the bottom there is a street view uh, picture of how it looks like. This was the closest I was able to get to this waterfall. Uh, the resolution is you know, pretty nice. I like all the waves breaking around the uh, rocks. Uh, OpenAT, uh, thank you OpenAT. Uh, they have uh, worked for years producing uh, very important data sets for agriculture. And so this is probably the easiest one to explain. Uh, these are uh, Central Valley California uh, fields which uh, evaporate a lot of water because they are fields. And you can see that blue areas when there are no fields have much less evapotranspiration. And this reminds us that there are huge problems uh, with water in California. Uh, and this is very easy to see uh, on uh, open data datasets. Uh, SMAP. This is actual uh, mystery which I don't know the answer to. So if somebody knows, you know, please tell me. Um, SMAP is soil moisture from NASA. Uh, we prepared this data set with help from NASA, so thank you. And they also were very nice to write tutorials. SMAP was one of the most requested data sets, so we're happy to have it now. Uh, so once we have it, I decided to look for some outliers. And I went to Sahara and I found some green areas which were suspiciously uh, too wet. And I don't know why. I went to uh, Sentinel-2, I went to Google Maps imagery, there is no obvious oasis. But there are several spots like this in Sahara. Maybe there are dead errors. Maybe this is real. I don't know. If any soul scientists are here, you know, I'd be curious to know why. Era 5 land. Era 5 land itself from Copernicus is not new. It's been uh, in the engine for uh, more than a year now. The new thing we have done this year is um, uh, compute uh, daily and monthly aggregates. So either mean or sum, whatever makes sense. And also we edit mean and max bands, which apparently was useful because I already get, I got a thank you from somebody yesterday. That's why the attribution is Google and Copernicus, because we also did a little bit of work here and you know, we have to say that uh, we did some work if some, there are some errors. Um, what did I uh, show here? These are wind speeds, just to show something new. Uh, I just wanted to see what they look like uh, across the world. Turns out they are pretty high in desert areas, especially in Saharas. I also don't know why. I tried to quick look up on you know, Wikipedia and Google. I'm not a scientist, so I'm not sure why. Tell me. Um, Hydro Atlas Basins, also pretty highly requested. We actually had level 12 Hydro Atlas Basins, the most detailed ones before, and we added the rest of them. And so the question asked myself, what are the driest river basins at level five? Level five is kind of intermediate level, so it's not too detailed, but not too large, so it will tell us about something about dry areas. And unsurprisingly, if we look at the driest ones with reputation below one millimeter per month, they're gonna be, of course, in uh, deserts. However, where are the wettest river basins? Precipitations over five meters per month on average. Uh, not this time. So because I looked at the particular 2022, uh, somebody said Eastern India. So uh, true, this is of course in tropics because where else would be wettest areas, but this year was A, uh, in Colombia, and B, in the Indonesian part of uh, Papua Island. Uh, I, now that I'm talking about this, I'd be curious to just you know, go and read accounts of people, what it's like to live in areas where it rains so much. It must be very interesting. Uh, and um, also I would like to highlight one of uh, Sam's data sets, uh, Global C, which is uh, present in North Engine now. These is lake depths, which is separate from typical bathymetry, which is typically about oceans, so this is new. Um, something that I learned is that Lake Erie, 
which is the reddest one at the bottom, uh, is the shallowest one. Um, according to Wikipedia, just because the glacier which carved out those lakes was running out of uh, steam being too far south, so it, was, it wasn't able to carve as big a depression as other glaciers. Uh, and because it's uh, relatively more shallow, uh, it uh, actually gets uh, freezes faster, also gets uh, warmer faster. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Bobby and JS uh, and Geoscience Australia. Uh, this is a data set uh, with annual uh, Landsat mosaics, cloud-free mosaics for each year over Australia. And I found this interesting formation called Uluru, which apparently is quite famous uh, for Australians. It's a huge uh, sandstone formation with a bunch of vegetation around it. On the top image, you can see this dark uh, vegetation spots, but they really kind of stand out if you look at NDVI. And finally, um, I think this counts an interesting puzzle because it applies to more just uh, this data set. NLCD is quite famous uh, US, continental US land cover data set. We had it before, mostly uploaded by USGS. They recently uploaded uh, this and other several versions. The new thing in this uh, release is one of the bands contains the number of changes per pixel across all NLCD years, changes flipping from one land cover class to another. And so this is the question you can ask about other land cover data sets, uh, but any guesses to what had the most changes in the US? Uh, sorry? Yeah, when I was discussing this uh, yesterday, uh, somebody also said agriculture, and if this were a more frequent data set like Dynamic World, it's most likely that's where it will be, uh, so I think um, somebody mentioned alfalfa plantations with multiple harvests. Uh, in this case, uh, when I plotted uh, the results, uh, this is a very uh, flat lake. It's called uh, Malheur Lake in Oregon. Apparently, it's so flat that the uh, basin often flips uh, from water uh, to dry and so on, and so that's why there are so many changes uh, over this lake. And these are all the mysteries I have for you, and I would like to uh, pass the mic to Sam. Thanks, everyone. And uh, it's really nice to go after Simon does, because Simon creates that big stage of like what it means to handle 90 petabytes of data. And then you can take a deep breath and say, OK, now it's the easier part. We don't have that much data, but we do different kinds of things with data also. So how many of you here have used the Awesome G community catalog? OK, it's so good to see this. The idea for the GE community catalog started in 2020 and when someone posted on the Google Earth Engine forum asking for Facebook's high-resolution settlement layer. It was a student at that point in time who wanted that data set and said, I really want this for my thesis. Can someone help me find this? It was, uh, this was in one of those humanitarian data set websites. It wasn't really available easily. Someone had to go and individually download the zip files, attach them together, and bring it forward. And I don't know why, I thought I had the free time, and I decided to spend a weekend on it. And I said, okay, I'm going to bring this together. So I wrote a blog, and I wrote the tools necessary to bring all these data sets together. And I said, okay, here you go. Here, I've just opened this collection for you to use the HRS whole data. And this was the start of the community catalog. It was one individual person making a request, and then few others who followed and said, can we make this other data set available, and this other data set available? And it was mostly the research community, but I love the research community. I was a researcher myself, and it's really nice to work with them because there is so much good science already done, but it's often buried in dryads or fig shares and Zenodo repositories, right? For you to be able to even open it and utilize it, you need to have a mechanism to first bring it into Earth Engine. And this was born as a result of that. So, the community data set catalog, just to, I know that we, it says the Earth Engine community catalog. We are not funded by Earth Engine. <laughs> First and foremost, we are not funded by Earth Engine, but we are on a grassroots mission to be in collaboration with Earth Engine. We are present to bring other data sets that are not in the master catalog to make it available for the larger community to use. Our goal was easy, and it was to promote accessibility and also to make sure that 
scientists, researchers who want to make their data sets, their research codes more reproducible, accessible, we can help them in that process as well. So apart from putting the data in Zenodo and Figshare, you can also make a request and we can make that data set available to you in the community catalog. So I'm gonna go through some of the features of the community catalog and then I'm gonna to go to give you a walkthrough of the community catalog as well. Right now what you can do with the community catalog is search and use data sets. So you can go to the website and you can actually search for a data set type. So you can actually just type the word hydrology and look at all hydrology data sets. You can look for more specific things like globathy, or you can look for fire data set, or you can look for vegetation and forestry and all of those things. And they are thematically arranged, which means you can actually go and find those data sets. They are stack compliant, which means that for most of these data sets, there's an internal stack metadata that I do generate from time to time. Um, I'm in the process of actually finishing up the last bits of the vector pieces, but these will be available to everyone as well. Um, one of the things that we are also building is an example code repository. Uh, so I usually will put with every single data set that goes out, similar to how Earth Engine puts out the example repository, we also have an example repository where every single community data set has an example attached to it. So you can go and click on an example and get started. You don't have to start with just browsing uh, the catalog itself. And we're also trying to get more and more of these examples from the community members, because I have to sometimes write my own examples, and I may not be the domain expert on that example. So sometimes it's really nice when someone contributes an example and says, can you update this data set to have this example, So, which is really nice. And by the way, all of this goes back to everyone who is donating the data sets or contributing the data sets, right? So the current process is someone creates a GitHub issue and basically will bring in these data sets, which are arranged by these different categories. So you can see here the, all the number of categories that exist right now. And we kind of sometimes break and make new categories. That's because one of the categories is too large. So we now have a new section on fire monitoring because the number of data sets that were just related to fire grew large enough that I said that, okay, we need to have a new subsection to do that. Uh, just to talk a little bit about numbers, this is uh, from the 2022 presentation that we gave on the community catalog. I'm gonna go to the next slide because, again, I'm talking about the 2022 uh, statistics. We had 287 image collections. 2023, we have 450. We had 434 feature collections. We now have 614. In terms of the sheer number of images, it was 644,000. We grew almost twice or more. That's a million plus images right now. And from the 569 million plus images of features, we are now at over a billion plus features and feature collections available to you. In terms of sheer volume of the data set, it grew from 105.54 terabytes in one year to 322 terabytes. This is all available to you for use right now. And what I'm gonna do right now is just gonna show, have a rundown. So every time I release a data set, by the way, the cadence of which is about a weekly, I try to do, go through those issues that people submit and say, can you fetch this data set from this website? Sometimes I get a request for people who are keeping these data sets on some FTP server that I have to go and crawl and get these data sets, assemble it. I usually release a GIF of all the data sets that are in there. This is a mashup of GIFs for just about four months of data set. So you can see a lot of these data sets being introduced and going through. So I, I thought it would be interesting to just show you the variety of data sets that are already existing. Uh, this thing makes me really happy. So we created the catalog web page and I went there a couple of days ago because I wanted to see what the stats are. More, more importantly, I'm a geographer. I love looking at maps, and uh, analytics will actually allow you to generate this map that shows which country is at least using that website. And one of the things that made me really happy was the fact that almost all of them have visitors, at least, that are living there. So that, that part is like, for me, is like a statement that, okay, there's other people in different parts of the world. It's not just centered around a specific geography. There are people from around the world who find this data set useful, or at least 
somehow through a Google search or through a tweet or something else land up right here. Okay, so I wanted to give a live demo of the website. If someone wants to visit the community catalog, they can go to this website or scan the QR code. I'm gonna hold for about 10 seconds and then we'll go to the live demo. And I'm gonna set up my computer in the meantime. Can we switch to the live demo, please? Thank you. So this is the community catalog. It's g-community-catalog.org, or just go to that bit.ly link that I just showed, or the QR code that I just showed. What is really interesting about the community catalog, like I said, you have all of these. They're arranged in a way where you're able to search for by thematic groups. So if you wanted to look for the population data sets, I can actually go in and look at the high resolution settlement layer. Anyone who contributes data set, I wanted to make, it, make sure that there is citation information because it has to go back to people who have contributed this data set. So if you are a person who made this data set and I want the other people who use that data set to then be able to cite you. There's also license information, and there's usually an example code. So if I open the example code link right now, it'll open up, or it should open up. Okay. And I'm gonna hit run, wait a few seconds, it should pop up. I think I hit run, okay, yeah. It's just taking a little bit. Okay, we'll come back to this. But the idea being that you can do the same for different kinds of data set, and you have a lot of vector and raster data sets here. So you can go into soil properties, you can go into elevation and bathymetry, you can do that. You can also look here, uh, you can come to the search bar and you can actually say, I wanna look at elevation data sets and type elevation, and it'll kind of give you all of the elevation data sets that are available, so you can also use that to go to that page, let's say I wanted to look at um, Geomorph 90, Geomorph uh, morphometric layers, I can do that, and it'll give me, so like I said, you know, like give credit or give citation, that was core, like it's foundational. I want people to be able to discover these data sets, I don't want them to be locked in in some zipped repositories or hard drives that people are lugging along with them, I wanted it to be more accessible to the public. And the other thing that you can do is actually look at these examples again and then uh, run them, like I said. So this one was running, and it's still running. So you can actually see that these example catalog, this example repository, will allow you to actually go in. And let me show you where this repository sits. So there's a page, there's a section in the uh, community catalog page itself where it says getting started. And if you go to the getting started, it says there's a section on navigating the catalog, and then there's the access, the GE community catalog repo. And if you click on this link, this will be added to your readers section. So you will have all of these data sets along with the examples and scripts and everything else, it'll be available to you. And as I add new data sets, uh, this repository will populate on your end as well. Every time you hit refresh, it'll populate at your end as well. Okay. Um, the other small thing I wanted to tell you was the fact that, yeah, uh, sometimes you can even use tools. So I also wrote tools like gadd and gup. And one of the things you can do with these is you can search catalogs using this. I don't know if a lot of people use this functionality, but I can actually use this to search both the master catalog. So I can actually say, I wanna see all fire data sets available in Earth Engine, and I wanna do this programmatically. I can actually do this, where it'll go in, it'll look for all the data sets that are available, and it'll give me the link, the asset URL, thumbnail URL, all of the good stuff, right? But if I wanted to search in the community catalog, all I need to do is basically say source as community, and then it'll give me all the community da uh, da uh, data sets, you know, that are available to you that also link with this thematic tags. Now, the thing we're trying to do is improve on the tags, improve on keywords that you might be able to use to search across these data sets, but these are all of the things that are available. So feel free to visit this website. Uh, you can also go to the GitHub repository that powers it. You can click on that link and it'll take you the, to the GitHub repository. 
And really quickly, it's super easy to actually submit an issue or submit a data set request. You click on new issue, and it'll ask you, what do you want to do? You want to suggest a new data set? If you are the publisher and you want to bring your own data set, you can just say, I want to suggest a new community data set, and click on get started, and it's a form. You can fill out the form, it's normal text, you don't have to worry about anything in coding. You can just write down what your needs are, what the links are, and submit it. Make sure you include the license information. That's something that we absolutely need to make sure that it's available to everybody. Okay, can we go back to the slides again? Thank you. So as I said, the community catalog, portion of the community catalog will now be available as part of the community catalog piece of Google Earth Engine, which means that in that subsection that uh, Simon actually showed, you'll be able to find some of these data sets. The three data sets that I contributed that I thought would be really useful to people includes uh, Oak Ridge National Lab developed LandScan population data set. So I contributed that. I also contributed the Globathy data set and we also made sure that the uh, United States drought monitor data set, because a lot of people work with drought data, that is also available. A lot of these are static, right, because they're one-off. But a lot of these are hard work because they have to be maintained. Similar to Simon, I'm only, I'm only one person, I don't have a team, so, but I do have cron jobs, and cron jobs are super useful. So I have the, the drought monitor that's maintained every Thursday. Every Thursday, a cron job fires up, it goes and fetches the latest drought monitor data, and it batches it, processes it, and then uploads it to the Earth Engine collection, and it's available to you. So there are all of these things that undergo under the hood, so that's really nice to uh, be able to do that, automate that part. Like I said, the three data sets that are available in the catalog right now, in our total count, if you go to the website, the Community Catalog website, our total count right now, I believe, is 1,358 data sets across different thematic groups. So you can look at those and tell me what else you need. Um, again, you can go into the code editor. So those three data sets that I just mentioned, you will be able to search those now in your code editor. If you go into your code editor and type LandScan, you'll be able to see LandScan data set available to you. And what's new and what's coming? So new data sets are added and requested weekly. So I get about eight to 10 data set requests per week. So I try to work on maybe about three to four because I also have a different day job. <laughs> so I try to manage that with the expectation that I still want to continue doing this. But if people want to volunteer, I accept pull requests. Apart from submitting issues and bugs, if people want to submit pull requests and say, hey, I, I feel like there's an error here, I want to change this spelling here, or I noticed something wrong and I want to do that, please do. That's an immense help to me. And if you just want to volunteer, please meet me outside. I would love to talk to you. Uh, we are uh, also, we actually generate a change log, so you can actually look at the change logs that are available as well. And we are releasing 2.0 tomorrow. So what's new with 2.0, is 2.0 will have the license information in the JSON file, which means for users who have asked me for an automated way to filter data sets by license, you'll be happy to know that from tomorrow onwards, you'll be able to actually request from that JSON info blob. You can actually filter by license type, and you'll be able to do that. So if someone doesn't want to use a non-commercial data set, or someone is specifically look at, looking for a specific type of license, you'll be able to do that as well. Okay, so let's talk, uh, chat about data and more. That's my LinkedIn link, and you'll get the slide, so you can actually click on the link and go there. And if you go to my GitHub, there is additional projects that are related to the community catalog. And with that, I will hand it over to the publisher program and Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really amazing presentation. I mean, when I think about all the work that's being done, Honestly, very heroic efforts, I think, at times that are really going on within the data community. But it's clear, and I really en enjoyed Simon's presentation as well. I hope you did as well. Just thinking about kind of the stories, the interesting facts that exist within each data set themselves, right? Like you were able to bring in so many questions or even teach us a couple new things that we probably weren't expecting today on each of these data sets, right? So it's so critical when we think about what are the data sets existing? And even with 90 terabytes, we still have a session dedicated to how are we gonna talk about the new data sets that are coming into the program, right? So I think that's just a really incredible part of this community, and it also really speaks to the importance of the data sets that we hope to be continuing to bring bringing in through the work of all the folks on stage here.
So a little bit about myself. My name is Bobby. I'm a, I'm a former Googler, and I now work here at NGIS. I'm the general manager of North America. Part of my role is really thinking through how do we support Google, how do we support this community, and, and ultimately the customers that we have in common. So a little bit about us. We're a geospatial and sustainability organization. We've been a, a Google partner for over 10 years now. The organization is Australian-based. I am one of the, the few non-Australians at the company, so that's been an interesting adventure for me over the last couple of months as I've really gotten into this space. But I've been working with NGIS for over two years, especially in my role previously at Google. So we've, you know, we've been partners with Google for over 10 years working with Google Earth Engine, and we've really focused on bringing together both the geo ecosystem as well as the cloud. So a lot of the work that I do in particular really focuses on that intersection. So when I talk to companies, organizations, nonprofits, other groups, I'm thinking about how do I bring together this geospatial world, all of the world that many of you, you know, work in day in, day out, building, out, building models, bringing data together, but then also some of the things on the cloud side of the house around how will this be operationalized within a system, how will this be effective for an organization has, that has larger goals beyond just the Earth observation and other components that we're seeing here today. So when we think about our organization at large, we're an impact-focused organization. You know, geospatial and sustainability is really at the heart of what we do. So I provided just one or two quick examples that I think really illustrates some of what we do, some of our Australian focus to date, some of our expansion, but then really about kind of how we work and we partner with organizations and really the power of individual data sets and really changing our view of the world. So some of the work that we've done, for example, is with Coastal Risk Australia. So this was a project that was de delivered between Google, NGIS, and, and Coastal Risk Australia. And what we really wanted to make sure is we understood the coastal inundation and flood risks associated with, with climate change around Australia. You know, this was a really, I would say, both interesting and challenging work, right, when we talk about what is going to be impact on communities, on societies, as it relates to something like coastal inundation risk. There's a, there's a really kind of complex conversation that we want to have where just because we're bringing this data in and just because we're learning these insights, there's still a whole world around how we communicate, how we partner with these types of organizations to spread that message. So some of the things that I'll show you over the next couple of slides is really around what does it mean like for an organization to provide this information out to a community and to other folks. So, so really, I think this kind of speaks to the heart of our organization is we want to build out great models. We want to use the data and the data sets provided within Google Earth Engine, but we also want to think very much about what is the mechanisms that, that organizations and people within these communities can use to actually work with this data. So a lot of the work started in kind of mainland Australia, and we were, we were proud to, to bring some of this work to some of the, the Pacific islands surrounding Australia. So in particular, I'll, I'll show you over the next slide or two some of the work we did in Vanuatu. You know, what's so exciting for us on this work is this was actually recognized as the United Nations Momentum for Change Award as part of the Paris Climate Change Conference a few years ago. Right? So this is really impactful work that really takes in the heart of that Google Earth Engine work and says, what is the value of these data sets and empowering those in, in communities around it? So I'll spend just two or three slides here really talking about some of the work we've done in Vanuatu. And again, this is really building into this whole publisher and data story, so kind of keep with me as, as I go through this. So we've really brought some of this data together to show this concept of how, what is the current circumstances as it relates to high, high tide, and what are these kinds of climate projections that we may be looking for in the future. It's an unfortunate fact that Vanuatu is considered one of the most uh, threatened countries in the world, given the impact of sea level rise, which is growing much at a much higher rate than it is around the world, and impacting this low-lying low coastal nation or sorry, Kualang Island Nation. So when we, when we bring together some of these different components, by, by 2100, the year 2100, with just a 7,400 centimeter increase, we're going to see this massive change within, within this type of, within these communities. And when, when we overlay additional information on top of that, we can start to realize that, you know, of the 680 uh, buildings in this community, we expect over 475 of them to be inundated by 2100. So I hope this speaks to the kind of both of the storytelling and the impact and the value of having this kind of critical data and the role that public sector related organizations will play in bringing this insights over to their communities. So it's really as a result of the work that we did in organizations in moments like this and our partnership in, in very much with Google that allowed us to kind of be the preview partner for this Earth Engine Publisher program. And I'll say the ambition, I'll go through it a little bit slower, I know I've been talking a tiny bit fast here, is really just to, I just wanna make sure that this kind of resonates with you all, is our goal as part of this publisher program is to facilitate the self-service delivery of high value earth observation products by public sector organizations with the goal of reaching hundreds of thousands of users really just like you through the Earth Engine Data Catalog.
And I think as we think through this process, we've been working with the Earth Engine team for over 12 months to establish this program. And our goal really is to make sure that we're amplifying the impact of these public sector organizations, many of whom you know, are here today and the kinds of organizations that we are, you know, either work with or partner with, and making sure that they have the right tools and technologies to actually be delivering this on their own. You know, I think you know, when we've heard from some of the folks already on stage, this has been a fairly heroic effort to get this catalog to the place it is today. While that is wonderful, there's a little bit more that we can do in bringing together this ecosystem and allowing some of these organizations to take on some of their own self-service delivery, and that's really part of our goal. For those of you who are based here in the United States, you know, may know something a little bit about the open data mandates that have been going through the United States. So this is, is really an, an, an area of particularly high interest as we think about what public sector organizations are looking to do from a priority perspective. So just a little bit about the program, and I'll spend the rest of my time going through kind of what do we hope to accomplish as part of the program, what are those key activities that you might be able to look forward to, and then provide a little bit of an example of the work that we've done with Geoscience Australia to this date. So kind of on the, on the left side here, some of the key points is really, we're really focusing on organizations that have an open data focus. It should probably be in their top three or top five priorities of what they do. And they're looking for more tools, more platforms, and more ways to make sure that their data is useful by their community and by, by researchers and scientists. We're also trying to make sure that we really work with the top public sector organizations globally. You know, NGIS is an Australian organization, and the example we've provided today it comes out of Australia. But our intent is not necessarily to just be focusing on Australia as far as this is concerned. We're really thinking about working globally across a number of different organizations and looking to hopefully partner with some of you here in the audience potentially around what that might look like. And then as it relates to the program, you'll see a little bit more content on this in, in just a couple of slides, but really talking about this, is, the program is designed to build out this self-service capacity and capability within an organization. So you're gonna spend a couple weeks working with us. We're gonna be building out a certain amount of the, the workflows, the operating procedures, helping you get your first couple of data sets online and really kind of guiding you the, through that process, but ultimately getting you and your organization in a place where you can take on a lot of this work, you know, relatively from a, from a hands-free, or or I guess hands-on in your, in your perspective as, as we go forward. So I, I think, you know, when I, when I think about this program, some of the things that are interesting for me is like, and I think I was quite excited to see that like, this is really going to be a big part of how we think about Earth Engine data moving forward, right? Like, we've been relying on kind of the core catalog and we've had the awesome catalog and these other groups together, but there's this really nice consolidation moment that we think is gonna increase the, the accessibility, the searchability, and ultimately continue to grow this ecosystem beyond what we're seeing here today. And I think that's, that's quite an exciting goal is to say, how can we make it so that more organizations that are creating these data products can be involved in this self-service publishing moment? So I, I, we have a quote from, from our partner, Geoscience Australia, and there's a couple pieces that I highlighted out here that I thought were hopefully resonating with you and the organizations that you work with. So I'll read the quote out, but spend you know, a couple seconds elaborating on the parts that really stood out to me. So, Geoscience Australia is delivering Earth observation of enduring value. I thought that was a particularly interesting statement to make, is that it needs to be the kinds of data sets that we're working on. We may not know all of the use cases initially, and these use cases will continue on and grow as, as we continue on with these programs. Right? Enduring value, I think, is it's a really strong principled moment as we think about the data and the contributions that hopefully you all will be making to this community. And further, we, that helps government, communities, and industry. Right? There's many different players and actors who are really using this Earth Engine data today. As part of the commercialization moment that Google Earth Engine went through just, just a year or so ago, there was really this recognition of a moment that you know, industry, other types of organizations are really starting to bring in this data for a wide variety of use cases that may, we may not have realized initially, or may have some amount of business value that was not initially known about by some of the research community, right? So really making sure that this data is valuable across those types of, of stakeholders. And then finally, to address challenges and enhance opportunities facing Australia now and into the future. The Digital Earth program is focused on making, dig, making data available through leading platforms to reach new users and engage with the Earth observation community. And I think from what we've seen here, the community is very much here and, and with us, and I think it's a very exciting moment for us to be working together with Geoscience Australia. So I'll go through a little bit of their goals on the top, but really this should probably resonate for many of you. Is this is the kinds of organizations you know, that, that we work with, that we partner with, and is very much probably very similar for you and, and your stakeholders. So there's three data sets that we're focusing on and prioritizing as part of this initiative, as part of the release. The annual water summaries per calendar year since 1986, geomedians, and land cover. And if, you go on, and if you go on to the site right now, you'll see that one of them is online, the other two will be on in the next week or so. So that's something we're really excited about, is to kind of continue building out these categories and, and, and adding more data in from organizations like Geoscience Australia. 
So a little bit more about what is this program and managed program that I've been mentioning? You know, we've talked a little bit about the goals and the values of it, but now what would you actually be doing if you were to working with an organization like NGIS in order to set up some of this publishing capability? So I'll go through some of the various components here around engagement and awareness. So it's really saying like, what are those pieces of open data that are either being prioritized, that are requested a lot by your community, that are particularly good fit for Earth Engine? How do we build the awareness within the organization of this should be something we can prioritize now to actually be ingesting it and bringing into the Google Earth Engine catalog? Further, a little bit on, from an onboarding and capacity building perspective, how do we start to ingest both the static data, the data that we have already in place today, but then also think about some of the data pipelining for how will we take in continuous data, new data sources, and make sure that we're building those in and, and kind of showing what that publishing would look like moving forward for the rest of that catalog. Finally, because this is a managed program and we're gonna be working closely with you all for a little while, the idea is that we'll have a bit of a go live moment when you kind of see it show up on the website, there's a whole new section there, you get your logo, you get a lot of this new information, and we wanna make sure that as we go into that moment, we're publishing the data, we're making sure that there's good QA, there's good examples, all of the things that an organization might not know how to do or might want a little bit of support on bringing together, we wanna to be with you through that process, especially from a go live perspective. And then finally is around a network and support. So it's, it's early days, as you know, here for, for the publisher program. But I think what we're trying to make sure we create is a little bit of this network and a little bit of an ability for these public sector organizations to be both receiving additional support, whereas necessary, but also kind of being able to collaborate with their peers and also hopefully reach the, the scientific community and facilitating some of the conversations and some of the use cases around this data that we've been talking about and refining so much over the last couple of days. So just a little bit of a timeline for you all if this is of interest to you in particular or you think you, your organization or those you work with might be looking to, to kind of get this started. So we brought in, you know, as we mentioned, Geoscience Australia as our early adopter. We've been working with them for about two months on this process. Here we are at the, at the launch, you know, date today, and the idea is that over, you know, through the rest of the calendar year, we'll be bringing together and, and looking to start our first cohort in January. And the idea is that we would be running additional cohorts roughly every three or so months kind of based on interest and, and kind of our ability to you know, continue on with the program and as we see it get refined. So those are, that's a little bit of kind of what you'd be able to look forward to. So you know, our hope is that you'd you know, begin uh, potentially working with us and, and going as part of this process and we'd be able to really start working on this in earnest in January. So that's a little bit of, of our timeline and what we're hoping for. So yeah, thank you so much for your time and for your attention. You know, it's been, it's been really a, a pleasure to present after these both. I, I admire them both very much for all the work that they've done to bring in all the data into the, into the community. And I'm really hoping to get the opportunity to work with many of you. So we have a landing page and I know you'll be able to find this on the slides. It's both our, the website where we explain a little bit more of the program. We have a sign up form explicitly if that's what you're interested in. Or you can just reach out to me directly as well. So my email address is here. That is my normal headshot that I use for these things. So yeah, it hopefully looks like me. But thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Are we standing or sitting? Yeah, I think we're just gonna. Yeah. So we're opening it up for question and answers. So if people have questions, use the microphones. And we're happy to take questions. There's microphones on both ends. Uh, hey, Sam. Hey. I have a question for you. I, we can talk offline, too, but um, would uh, your, your community-created created EE catalog, would you want to partner with Pangeo Forge and, like, sure. have a, well, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Okay. I love it. Uh, thank you for the great work you guys are doing. Um, for me, it's just like... Uh, Accessing to the, just like watching a movie, have the entire movie database for free, like <laughs> now over 90 petabytes, so it's, uh, it's great. And uh, specifically about question about the data catalog, uh, Simon saw the NALCD 2021, uh, National Link Cloud Database. I've tried to use that, but I noticed that it only in, have the 2021. So for the 2019, has like the time series. I'm not sure if this is like plan to port it over, because right now I'm trying to migrate to the latest one, but it only has one image. Uh, NLCD data were uploaded by USGS, uh, so maybe, you know, let's, without going into too much detail, let's, you know, talk after the meeting and we might send them feedback to see if they need to add something. Okay. Thank you very much.
Thanks for the presentation. This is just out of curiosity. I think it's for Sam. Um, as a product, because the catalog is clearly a product, an amazing one, do you think that people are getting more attention on their data sets because of the exposure that you maybe enable them to have through the catalog? Is there any kind of like metric that you're using to evaluate your impact in the community? So um, I wish we could calculate how many downloads or accessibilities there are from Earth Engine. Maybe we will be able to. Um, but Right now, all I get is word of mouth when professors do reach out and say, thank you for hosting our uh, data sets. It's made this available. It leads to increase in citations. And that's something that's been reported by the community. I rely on word of mouth or someone who has already hosted something. They come back and say, oh, you hosted this data set. It was great because some others were able to find it. And we were able to collaborate on it. That's one of those things that I'm really seeing is Someone saying that, oh, I didn't even know that this data set was already, like, this already existed, and I was starting work on this, and I found this list of other data sets and other people that I can now go and talk to. So that's my way of measuring it. And apart from that, just the visits and just sometimes just emails and conversations like these are helpful, yeah. Uh, and just to understand the sort of the link between, so there's, there's kind of a, a thousand plus data sets on the community catalog now, and, and there are three of those which have been kind of selected to feature on the, the main catalog. What's the sort of plan for the, the link between those two things? Which ones get moved across? Um, will all a thousand be there eventually? What's the plan? Are you talking about the community catalogs? Yeah, so the, there's the kind of the thousand on if you go to the community catalog directly, and then there were the three that you'd yeah. singled out. So it's a great question. So when we started the project, and even right now, the community catalog relies on people actually visiting the website and going to the GitHub repo, reading through the issues, understanding that if no one submits an issue, if no one submits a data request, then the community catalog stops right there. So while we want to increase and add more and more data sets to the Earth Engine version of it, we still want to maintain a large portion of the catalog as is on our web page because we feel that will drive people to go to our GitHub repositories and create issues. This is not something we charge people for, right? Like this is a completely open service, but as with any other open source project, if, if everyone feels that they can just search right there in the code editor, no one goes and says, okay, I'm going to make a contribution. So we kind of want to balance that, both sides of those things. So right now the plan is to move a few more and then to continue growing the community catalog. And maybe fre frequently I will decide on like moving a few of those over to the main catalog as well. But it's a great question. It's something I feel like a lot of open source people had to struggle with. And for us, I was like, I want to create initiatives, right? Like actually have an insider's program in the community catalog where if you are a person who has provided us with this open data sets, then there's about eight or nine data sets that I have uploaded and I've called them the insider's catalog. What it really means is I'm giving you an incentive. It's a free incentive. You submit a data set, it doesn't have to be yours, but you submit a data set to be included, and I add you to a Google group, and you can access these eight additional data sets that includes, for example, Canada, high resolution, one meter and 0.5 meters, DEMs and stuff. It includes the Microsoft global road data set, those kind of things. So if no one has contributed yet, it's an impetus for you to contribute. So hopefully that answers your question. Is there somewhere that you can subscribe to find out like when a data set gets updated? Obviously not a really quickly updating ones, but ones that are, are perhaps um, monthly or annually or in between. Um, All right, uh, excellent question. So there are two ways to uh, answer it. Uh, first, for periodic image collections like Landsat, which get updated continuously, people have been asking about uh, something called PubSub or maybe similar mechanism to get notified. This would be nice to have Earth Engine in general. Uh, we don't have it right now. Uh, hopefully, eventually, it'll get created, but uh, right now, we don't have immediate plans. 
Um, a more probably narrow question, but more important is uh, when we have a new version, like when NLCD gets updated from one release to another, how do you notify users about uh, this change? And right now, we are not, uh, Earth Engine is not doing a very good job about this. We uh, sometimes you know, announce this on Twitter, on developers list. We don't have a systematic log, like I think uh, Sam's catalog uh, has been run. Uh, that's something, you know, I, it's very much in the back of my mind. I would like to get at least a decent change log going for that. Um, I'm not sure how to make it machine readable. That's something I've been asking actually data providers like NASA. Can't you have some kind of machine readable uh, form saying, you know, we switch from this ID to that ID and it's fair to ask the same thing from us. So uh, it's no good answer right uh, now, but you know, that's a thing that we need to think about. Yeah, and I'll just say that uh, apart from the change log, um, there are some people who have been able to also set up like, hey, every time I update my, on GitHub, there is a, a watch function. <laughs> so if you start a repo or if you watch a repo, it actually alerts you every time I push any change. But if you don't want to know about every change, you don't have to. But you can actually look for differences in just that JSON blob that I was talking about. So every time there is any change, I'll actually have a section that says last updated. And Earth Engine actually also stores that information. It actually has a section that says last updated, when the collection was last updated. So you can query for that. Um, I've been thinking or toying with the idea of including like subscribe with an RSS feed just for that page. So every time there's a new update to the change log page only, you get an update. So if people would like to experiment or talk about that, please meet me outside and talk about it. And, I'll see if there's a way for me to embed a subscribe here <laughs> to get change log updates for the community catalog piece at least. Just a quick follow up on regarding the subscribe to the update of the data catalog. Uh, same previously view like a CSV file list over the data set and I actually view on top that I have a cap repo. They automatically update every day. Yeah. And then so you will see the change log like which data set gets updated, what image gets into that. Yeah. It's all my GitHub reports I can show you. So you can yeah. actually subscribe to the repo, like watch the repo, you will get like notification. Yeah. If you want to get email every day, you watch and you will see what's being added and new data set being added. Yeah, yeah. and uh, git diff is your friend. <laughs> you can always look at the difference what happened from the day before, you know, so it's always useful. Yeah. All right, thanks for the presentation. Uh, small question for Simon. Uh, we were lucky enough to have a glimpse of the publisher page today, and we have NGIS with us today. Do you have any more information for upcoming publishers? Do you have any plans or other organizations you are working on to be added to this publisher page? Uh, nothing we are ready to announce right now, and further, this is a more of a question you know, back to you and to the audience. You know, let's talk about how you think this might work, and uh, you know, we'll... Uh, figure out you know, what this means for us. Any other questions? Also, people use the community catalog and want stickers. I have stickers for your laptops. Meet me outside and I'll give you stickers. <laughs> Can I get one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, really I asked too many questions. I noticed in the uh, publisher catalog right now we have the planet, so it used to be in the data catalog. So it looks like move that from the official data catalog to the publisher. Would they also apply to some other data set? For example, UAGS, NASA, they also have like, it, it can be treated as a publisher, but I'm not sure if they have people yeah. to maintain that. So what's kind of plan for kind of separating the official data catalog maintained right. by Earth Engine and those maintained by organizations? Uh, right, so Planet already was shared directly from source assets, so it wasn't even so much move as basically a rebranding. We just, you know, sort of repairing them to different pages. We do have uh, basically, you know, uh, older beta version of people uploading assets and us um, putting them in the catalog under different IDs, which, you know, was less convenient to use, so we hope to switch to publisher model. Uh, I think once we have a better picture of where this program is going, uh, we would like to transition all the data sets uh, into that model, at least for future updates. Uh, we don't want to break all the edges, so you know, we will try to keep them alive as long as possible. It won't change the path, just everyone knows. Even though they're moving in subsections, it doesn't change the path, right? 
The path remains the same for the data sets uh, for now. Well, we don't want to change any paths. We're actually holding okay. on data sets for a long time. So uh, yes, we're not going to break all data sets. But for future ones, we will try uh, a new, the new program. Got another question. Let's say I'm interested in fire. So I want to look at all the data sets for fire, that with the fire in the tag. Is there a place I can look and I'll get all the hits in all three catalogs? Or do I have to make three separate searches? Um, so the tool I just showed uh, will list at least. So if you don't actually give it, so if you, um, Actually, right now, there isn't an all button, but I can just add an all button that'll allow you to look across all catalogs. Yeah, that should be easy enough, yeah. That's a good idea, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you have further questions, you know, please catch us later, uh, or uh, probably the best uh, way to talk about this later is subscribe to developers' lists if you're not there already, and ask questions uh, there. If you have specific bug requests, as you probably know, go to the Get Help page and file bugs to uh, you know, ask for new data sets or updates to existing ones. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.